Hello and welcome. I'm thrilled to be here with Deb Liu, an extraordinary leader who's done a phenomenal job leading Ancestry. She's an author focused on empowering women leaders as well. And it means a lot to me personally as the father of four daughters who are also pushing me to be better in this area. And here at Blackstone, this is an important area for us. We're proud to back women CEOs and entrepreneurs. We're committed to building diverse teams. And more broadly, we wanna talk about the idea of being builders, building financial security for our investors, building stronger businesses with our portfolio companies, and building lasting careers for our people. Deb definitely models this builder mindset. She's the president and CEO of Ancestry, a leading digital family history and consumer genomics business with 3.6 million subscribers. She spent 11 years on Facebook's leadership team. She was previously at PayPal, where she led the eBay marketplace product team, built the charitable donations and social commerce teams, and worked in corporate strategy. Throughout her career, she's been a big advocate for women in technology and business. She co-founded a nonprofit, Women in Product, which connects more than 30,000 women leaders in technology. She's the author of Take Back Your Power, sharing lessons she's learned building her career. I'm so excited, Deb, to be speaking with you here today. It's great to be here today. It's great to have you. So let's start with how did you get here? How does somebody, you know, get from wherever you started from? Where did you grow up? You went to college, you had your career. Give us a little bit of the backstory on how you end up getting to the top of the mountain. It's something everybody's curious about, particularly as a woman in a male dominated Silicon Valley industry. You know, I was born here in New York in Jackson Heights, and I grew up here until I was six. And because of discrimination, my dad actually, you know, had to move to South Carolina. And so I grew up in a small, small town in South Carolina, pretty unconventional for someone who looks like me and my family. And eventually, you know, I spent uh, many years there and I graduated and I ended up at Duke studying engineering, following in my father's footsteps. I wasn't 100 percent sure. And like, you know, everybody graduating from school who aren't sure I ended up it was either banking or consulting. So I ended up in consulting for a couple of years, eventually landed at Stanford uh, to get my MBA. And at that point, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And I stumbled on this tiny startup called PayPal, and I thought this would be a lot of fun. So I spent several years there, and it was just an incredible introduction to tech. And from there, my career really took off. I became a product manager, and I led the eBay PayPal integration for many years, and then eventually went to eBay to lead the buyer experience. And then Facebook called. And at the time, there were 900 people there. It's pretty crazy to think about, maybe 150 million users. And I did pitch her Facebook Marketplace at the interview. I spent five years pitching it and no one listened. And then, you know, I had the opportunity to build it. But during that time, I also built games. I worked on a number of different initiatives, Facebook Pay and Payments, um, an ad network. And so I just was able to do so many interesting things. And, you know, 11 years later, I got the call for Ancestry. That was a good call to take. So thank you for taking that call. And I love Duke. I have one daughter who graduated and another one who's going there. So we're yes. big Blue Devil fans. So talk about Marketplace. Did you have to push to make it happen? It was a ton of resistance, mostly because there were so many other priorities. I worked on platform. At the time, mobile monetization was an issue, so I was pulled in to work on mobile monetization. We built mobile app install ads. Then mobile, they, we built the mobile ad network. So, so many things were just taking priority. An abundance of riches. Yes, and opportunities all abound. But at the same time, I really believe that this could be such an important connector for people and communities. And so every year I would pitch it, we would have, you know, what are we funding the next year? And I would try to get it funded. And finally I got some traction and I pulled together a small team. It was just a handful of people and we started this project. Amazing. Okay, so tell us about Ancestry. Yeah. Let's maybe start with what Ancestry is today and then we'll walk back to what got you excited and what got you scared when you got the call? Well, Ancestry is the leader in family history and family storytelling. It is the place where people are able to look back at their history and learn about that, get access to content, and it's just an incredible genealogy platform. But, you know, I don't use just the words genealogy platform because it seems like a very niche area. It's really a family connection place and it's a hub for consumers to really connect with each other. What's really been interesting since I joined is that, you know, 50% of 
people who are on our platform tell us that they want to be able to make this discoveries not just for themselves, but to share it with families. And more than half of Americans actually are really interested in learning more about their family history. So our opportunity to grow is tremendous. And what we've done over the last you know, 40 years of the company's life has been to really connect people with their family history. But more than that, we also have the DNA test so that you know, 23 million people have taken their DNA test and you can find your family that you had never known you were matched to. And so it's just been an opportunity for people to really uncover parts of their history that they could never have imagined before. And when you got the call, did you initially think, wait, this is sort of yesterday's news. Is this really for me? What made you concerned and what ultimately pushed you to make the decision to go for it? Well, what was really, when I got the call, it was not an immediately natural fit. I started uh, actually my own journey discovering my family history. But as children of immigrants, my husband and I, our parents are immigrants, there just wasn't a lot of content for us, you know, especially we came from Asia. And so when I used the product, I said, you know, I don't see myself in this product. And I had always built products that I could see myself in. And so I was really trying to understand it. And as I talked to the team at Blackstone and as I talked to the, the team at the company, I realized though that that's the opportunity which is that you know, family history, people for whom we don't have records still love their family just as much. And they are just as passionate about discovering their family history. So how do we build a product that's more inclusive? How do we build ancestry for all? So that even if we don't have records, which we have you know, tons of records, but not for people from certain histories. And so how do we actually build a place where families can still connect? And my family connects on Ancestry, but we do it by sharing family photos and talking about our experiences, something that we have added over the last couple of years. So this is a leading question because you're in Blackstone's offices at 345 Park Avenue. Um, but candidly, and you're talking to Blackstone's president and chief operating officer, <laughs> but how has it been to work with Blackstone? What's been most helpful? And if you have any constructive feedback, I'll take that as well. You know, one of the things that I love about the partnership with Blackstone, and I call it a partnership, because there's the ownership structure, but really it's about partnering and coming alongside. And that's been the wonderful part, is that we have all the resources of Blackstone. So when we wanted to look at our brand, you know, we had incredible folks like Johnny really come to us and say, here's how you should think about that. We have had such support on our sourcing and our, you know, how we think about sourcing, how we think about diversity. That is just an asset that we have never had. And it's been incredible. I think more than that, though, it's really the partnership around how do we iterate on how we think about the future of the company? What is the thesis you came in with and how is that changing as we spend more time? And so over the past two years, it has just been an incredible partnership. I think the one thing I would ask more of is, you know, I would love to kind of align with what are other things we can do with other portfolio companies? I've had the opportunity to really be introduced to some great portfolio partners, but are there other things we can do? Are there more synergies that we can have? And I think that that's something which I hope we can unlock over the next couple of years. All right, that's a good work item for me to take on. I like that a lot. Um, final question on Ancestry. If you think about your aspirations for this business over five, 10 years, what would you love to see? How would it grow? How would it be different than the ancestry you're managing today? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about me to we, and that is really the core hypothesis of where we're gonna go from here, which is our product has been so incredible for so long for the 3.6 million users, but what if those folks brought their families along? That it's not just 3.6 million subscribers who are coming every month, but each of them are bringing two, three people on their families to really help unlock experiences and turn this from a solo endeavor to one where you actually have concentric circles of community. So your family, for example, your extended community, but then maybe a community that's gonna help you unlock areas that you never could imagine before. One of the things we're really doing is um, we're launching something called Ancestry Storymaker Studios, where you can actually have our members curate facts, images, records, talk about them, share and discover things together. And that's what's really exciting. It's not just putting a photo of your great grandmother on there, but then actually being able to connect over that and say, you know, someone else saying, hey, that's my great aunt. And this is something that you can connect over through Ancestry. So a bigger, more powerful network. Yes. Okay, let's pivot to diversity and inclusion, something you spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about. You wrote this book and there were some things in there that really stuck out for me, particularly this idea of women finding their own voices um, in a workplace. What would be the one or two points you'd wanna leave people with? 
Well, I call it take back your power for a reason. And it's because, you know, yes, like women have less, you know, power in the workplace. And yet we also give it away. You know, we get, we sit back when there's an opportunity to speak up. We give ourselves a free pass. We say no when the opportunity to say yes is there. And so part of writing this book is to say, you know, there's so much more power in your hands than you think there is. And so one of the things that you need to do is really unlock that. And that's part of the, the journey I've been on over the last 20 years in my work. And what would be the practical advice? Because you had some of that. So Well, so chapter two is not giving yourself a free pass. And I, I tell people, and I, I coach a lot of women, one of the things I say is, before you walk into a meeting, a Zoom or wherever you walk into a room, decide and intend what you want to get out of it. So my friend Carol Izazaki is a, is a um, leadership trainer. And she said, you know, we have these things called unintentional ridiculous strategies. You wouldn't go into a meeting and say, I want to add no value. Yeah. Or I'm just going to sit in the back and listen. But how many times do you walk out of a room having done exactly that? And so instead, choose the meetings you attend and then make sure that you what your intention is coming out and then ask yourself, did I accomplish what I wanted to do? Because otherwise, it's a waste of your time and the time of the people in the room. Very simple but powerful. Yeah. And in terms of bias, which you've obviously encountered, what's your best advice for, for women in particular? How do you deal with it when it feels like the playing field isn't level. Well, I'll give you an example. So there's been no, numerous studies that said that you know men are considered leaders if they're competent, and women are considered leaders only if they're both competent and warm. And in a two by two matrix, you know there are men who are warm and men who are not warm, and women who are warm and women who aren't. And yet at the same time, there's this extra, you know hurdle that I'm sure your daughters could tell you about. And that's a hurdle which I think all women face in the workplace, which is, and they expect it, by the way, it's not just men that expect it from women, other women expect it too. And so there are many women who aren't warm. And I grew up in a, in a place where I was very alienated, I was the other, and I was not a very warm person. And it took me a long time to figure out that this was really holding me back. But I can decide this is unfair. This is, a, this is a double standard that I'm not going to buy into. Or I could say, what does it mean not to be warm? And how do I change so that I can adapt to it? Is it fair? Absolutely not. And yet at the same time, in order to reach leadership, I had to really change a lot of my own behaviors and how I looked at the world. And I think that sometimes this is what the book is about, is the world isn't fair and the playing field isn't level. And what you get, to, you can't change the playing field overnight. And I wish I could. But instead, you get to choose what you decide to do within that. And that's why it's been so important to me to share these lessons with women to say, look, there are double standards. And the question you have to decide is how you're going to respond to it. By the way, that is definitely true. That for women, there's an expectation of warmth on top of competence, yes. which is an extra high hurdle, which is definitely not right. One other question. You and I have talked in the past about your faith, which is really important to you. And interestingly, in the technology world, it tends to be at times more secular place. Has that been a challenge for you? How do you think about your faith? You know, I'm very open about my faith. I wear a cross um, and people do ask me about it. But there have been a lot of people who have asked me, like, how can you believe, you know, how can you be a person of faith? You seem so reasonable. And I, my response has always been, well, you have a lot of assumptions about faith and, you know, competence. And, you know, it's actually opened a world of conversations. And so part of that is to say, you know, there are people of faith who are also people of science, who, you know, so many incredible leaders throughout the years have been people of faith and doesn't mean that they don't believe in science, that they're not reasonable, that they're not strategic, that they can't build. And so we have a lot of assumptions, I think, sometimes of people who are very different from us. And so it's opened up so many interesting conversations where it has unpacked a lot of these assumptions as well. You know, I talked about kind of um, bias against women, but, you know, there's also a bias of, you know, what do you believe? Because technology itself has become a type of faith that we believe in our ability to technology our way through almost anything. And yet at the same time, it is a type of faith that we can believe that as well. And so my faith and my Christian faith has been such an important part of my life. And it's something that I don't hide. And it's actually opened so many doors for me to talk about, you know, and really change minds. Core moral values that have helped you along yeah, the way. Absolutely. We're gonna go to a little bit of a speed round. Okay, okay here we go. Favorite place to travel. Ooh. We have a rule, which is there's too many places in the world, never go to the same place twice. But is there one you particularly loved? Well, so when I was growing up, my um, family's from Hong Kong, and so I loved going to Hong Kong. And we brought our kids multiple times, but it's mostly to see family. I was just there a week ago. Oh, I love it too. Beautiful place. Beautiful. 
The number of children you have, how old are they? So I have three children, a son who's 16, and a daughter who's 14, and another daughter who's 11. And do they treat you with high respect as a high-powered CEO? Definitely not. No, 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 that's <laughs> not what happened. What activities do you love doing as a family? So we cook together a lot. So, you know, we put, cook in bulk. So before I left, we made 120 pieces of naan so that they would have food before I leave. We, it's just such an incredible thing to do with your family is to nourish them, but also teach them the future of how to cook. And I really love doing that. With Pass them. on a lot of great traditions yes. doing it as well. All right, favorite binge-worthy streaming Ooh. series. So we just watched all three seasons of Jack Ryan in the last month. You know, when you start it, it's really hard to stop. So we kind of just did it like one week at a time. I would throw in Fauda, which Ooh. is a little disturbing, but okay. it is part of Candle, a BX portfolio Can't company. Can't wait to watch it. You should add it to your list. A serious one, how would you want to be remembered? You know, I think in, in any moment, you're actually meeting tons and tons of people in every single day. And I just want everyone to leave every interaction feeling like I gave something to it. Well, I can tell you, you've given something to me. So mission accomplished here. Thank you for your time, Deb. Thank you for your great leadership of Ancestry. And thank you for leading on these important issues related to diversity. It's really impactful. Thanks for the invitation.